Last month, Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey essentially sued the state of New York over the gag order that remains in place on Donald Trump even after his conviction on all 34 counts related to the Stormy Daniels hush money trial. The Supreme Court declined Bailey's request to delay sentencing and lift the gag order. Now here to discuss this is Josh Hammer, Newsweek senior editor at large. So Josh, legally help us break this down. What does this mean? Is this any anything about this normal? Well, first of all, great to be with you and congratulations on the new show. Very exciting stuff. Um, so, look, I mean, nothing that we are seeing play out right now in this election cycle with all the, with all the lawfare is particularly normal. I mean, we are living in extraordinary times. We are living in times where, where we are told that it is somehow democratic, that it is somehow the quintessence of democracy to deprive someone from ballot access under a ludicrous insurrection clause theory, 14th Amendment, Section 3. We are told right now that it is the quintessence of democracy to literally try to prosecute and toss your political opponent in jail. So no, to your question, we are not living in particularly normal or sane times at all. It, quite to the contrary, it is extraordinarily abnormal. Amongst the most abnormal, our domestic politics have been probably in, in at least a century, century and a half maybe, if you want to go back to, to the Civil War or so. But on this specific lawsuit from Attorney General Andrew Bailey, I mean, I'm hardly surprised that the Supreme Court did not do anything here. You, you had Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito who who basically said that they would agree to hear the case. They would not go ahead and immediately grant injunctive relief. They were not going to do anything and actually dictate to New York to strip a gag order or anything like that. You know, there's a there's a major primary tonight in Missouri, actually, in this attorney general race between Andrew Bailey and someone who, full disclosure, is a good personal friend of mine, Will Scharf. And, you know, Will is in private practice, a Trump attorney. And I say that for context, because I think what you're seeing here is the attorney general of Missouri, Andrew Bailey, try to kind of out Trump his primary opponent, who is, in fact, a private practice Trump lawyer. So there's some very kind of domestic internal Missouri politics going on here as well here. So overall, I'm not surprised at the way that this ended up resulting. I guess we'll see what happens in terms of further Trump lawfare, though. Josh, it's truly great to have you on for the first time, hopefully first of many. Um, well, let's talk about how typical it is to have a gag order in place uh, after convictions. Well, it's not typical. I, I mean, it's it, nothing about what we're seeing right now is typical. I, I, I mean, first of all, you, you know, a, a gag order is really not supposed to be on a criminal defendant at all, a, a, except in the most extraordinary of, of circumstances whatsoever there. I, I mean, the, the the gag order of anything, I, I mean, it would make more sense in most most circumstances to really put it on the prosecutor, not on the criminal defendant there. And this, this is kind of part of a broader scheme that we've seen with the, with the Democrat lawfare complex trying to invert the way that criminal law in this country and frankly, in, in the Anglo-American tradition works. So, for example, you know, we've seen the special counsel, Jack Smith, or I really should say the so-called special counsel, because per Judge Aileen Cannon and Justice Clarence Thomas, he's actually not a legit special counsel. So so-called special counsel Jack Smith has been making this argument for a while now that the government has a Sixth Amendment speedy trial clause right to wrap this thing up, meaning the Florida and D.C. federal probes before the November election. I mean, like, dude, where were you in criminal law 101 your first year of law school? I mean, the Bill of Rights, by definition of being the Bill of Rights, is there to protect you from the government, not to protect the government from you. So so it, it's totally inverted. It's totally backwards. This this gag order in New York City, I think, fits into this broader paradigm. You know, again, nothing we're seeing here is normal. Really, what I am personally interested in seeing when it comes to the Donald Trump hush money case, so to speak, in New York City, you know, from my perspective, Matt, there, th there's a very, very good argument that that whole thing should be tossed out in the aftermath of the Trump versus United States immunity ruling. Because what the, what the court said there is that when it comes to the outer periphery of even allegedly, even disputably official conduct, the outer periphery of, of all such conduct, there is a rebuttable presumption that all of it is immune. Now, there was testimony during this trial from multiple former White House aides to Donald Trump, namely Hope Hicks and Madeline Westerhout. It would seem to me that all of the evidence introduced from those two individuals that had anything to do with their communications with Donald Trump definitely fit this description. And it's really not good enough for Juan Marchand to say, OK, well, you know, even if you toss out that evidence, the balancing of equities or the weight of the evidence shows that he was guilty. That's not how it works. If you, if you have a tainted evidentiary pool, you have to toss the whole thing out. 
That is ultimately why this thing got delayed, the sentencing, over two months back until September 18th. That's what Trump's lawyers are now arguing in the filings now pending before the court there. We'll see if Mershon acts. No one can kind of put a gun to his head and force him. The guy's a very anti-Trump judge, so I wouldn't kind of bet on it, to be honest with you. But if he was an intellectually honest person, I think that he would toss that at this point. Josh, there's been a video that's going around from this past February. Representative Jamie Raskin detailed how Congress could prevent Donald Trump from taking office. And he he correctly predicted uh, that the Supreme Court would rule that Trump could not be disqualified from Colorado's presidential ballot primary, but in Section 3 uh, under the 14th Amendment. Let's go ahead and take a look at Raskin here. 2025 to tell the rampaging Trump mobs that he's disqualified. And then we need bodyguards for everybody in civil war conditions, all because the nine justices, not all of them, but these justices who have um, not many cases to look at every year, not that much work to do, a huge staff, great protection, simply do not want to do their job and interpret what the great 14th Amendment means. So, Josh, the Supreme Court noted that Congress is responsible for enforcing Section 3. So does what is he actually suggesting could happen right here? Yeah, the, the Section 3, 14th, 14th Amendment argument, is one of the most insane legal gaslighting operations, for lack of a better term, that I have ever come across in my entire lifetime. So this is an argument that you know, buried deep in this you know, 1868 constitutional amendment, the 14th Amendment, which was clearly drafted and ratified in the context of the Civil War. They were clearly talking about former Confederates there, this idea that if you were involved in insurrection against the Union that you could not hold office. I mean, the number of assumptions that you have to make in order to take that and to then transfer it to the Donald Trump January 6th context, there are literally at least four or five you know, different logical leaps of faith that you somehow have to make, notwithstanding the fact that the only time that this provision was actually authoritatively interpreted in an 1869 opinion written by Sam and Chase of Memory Serves, you, you, you know, back then, that opinion actually made fairly clear that it, that it, it, it was not self-executing, that Congress had to actually act on it. Anyway, long story short, this thing was always ludicrous on space. That didn't stop all the usual suspects from, you know, clamoring and talking on the cable news channels about how it was like an ironclad theory. So you've had J. Michael Ludig, who was once considered a very conservative Fourth Circuit judge, you know, some very good conservative lawyers, people people like Ted Cruz, John Eastman, Noel Francisco, they all clerked for Judge Ludig back in the day. He was considered a Supreme Court shortlister in the Bush administration. He's had a horrible case of Trump derangement syndrome. has gone totally off the rails here. He got on, on cable news when the Supreme Court agreed to hear this case, and he said that this was an open and shut case, that there was no chance that the United States Supreme Court was going to deny that Donald Trump was an insurrectionist who, who, who therefore could not run for office. Well, dude, not even Katanji Brown Jackson or Sonia Sotomayor bought that argument. That argument lost nine to zero in March. And, you know, I'm not sure if there was anything more quintessentially anti-democratic based on the definition of democracy that I learned when I was in grade school than literally trying to deny your opponent a place on the freaking ballot there. So, Jamie, this is what Jamie Raskin is talking about here in this particular clip. But again, this is just a Linskyite logic 101. The ends always justify the means. The means are irrelevant. Jamie Raskin is a hack. These people, frankly, are all hacks. Uh, a communist, too. Um, so so let's go to something positive. Um, there is something positive going on. I, I find it very interesting. I'm really curious what you think. Uh, Elon Musk right, is leading the charge um, with this lawsuit, and I trust, against this, these NGOs who um, the claim is are illegally boycotting, right, getting together and really what they're doing for people in the audience is demonetizing conservative media companies uh, or any company they don't like. Can you tell us about that case uh, and where you think this is going and if this is going to go somewhere good? Well, look, I, I, I mean, I'm happy that lawsuits like this are being brought. I, I, I mean, I, I don't need to tell you guys, but I mean, there has been obviously a deeply concerted effort to strip conservative media of advertisers for for many years now, you know, you, you know, certainly Tucker Carlson when he was on Fox News, I mean, you know, the advertisers left and right were trying to do that, and it's about time that we find out, you know, whether or not there is actual kind of collusion or 
cartelization, frankly, going on, trying to deny these these consumers, these media consumers, their right to actually see the content that they want. I, I think kind of zooming out and, and looking more generally at what is happening in antitrust law, because we obviously had this this massive monumental Google case in Washington, D.C. earlier this week. Yet you're starting to see the, a revival of an interest in antitrust law from many people on the right. I've been beating this drum for drums for frankly for many years now, and I'm very happy to see that many people on the right are starting to wake up to the importance of antitrust law. You know, there was a period of time, Matt, and I, I know that you know this, back during the 1980s, during the 1990s. You know, when when laissez-faire fundamentalism and this idea that corporations can do no wrong really kind of reigns supreme on the right there. But really, we've, we've seen the rise now of this sentiment, which recognizes properly that the corporate form, corporate governance is ultimately subservient to we the people. It is we the people that are sovereign. And corporations, to kind of going back to the classical theory of the corporate form, you know, they have their charter literally given them by the governance. And when the corporation then deviates from their mission, when they ultimately act in a way that were downs against the common good, not in line with the common good, they can have their actions curtailed, again, in the name of the common good. That, that kind of philosophically really was the idea of the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act, our foundational antitrust statutes. That's very much what's going on in this huge case in D.C. involving Google this week, finding that Google is a Sherman Act Section 2 monopoly there and all that that entails. So it, it's kind of that broader purview of reviving antitrust law with Elon Musk as a very, very, very powerful and, and public facing face of this new lawsuit you mentioned there, it gives me a lot of hope and a lot of cause for optimism, frankly, looking at the broader landscape.